Thank you. Yeah. So I'm, I'm afraid I missed Tom's Tom Lamont's talk yesterday. I, I thought I would be the only one talking about porphyry copper, but apparently not. But it's very interesting. And I'm not going to start out by claiming that I'm an expert on it, far from it. But it's very interesting. So I, hope, I want to share with you. So I'm going to talk about a porphyry copper in Papua. And you can see there, there is basically um, a bunch of limestones. And in the middle is a large a uh, couple of kilometers uh, set of volcanics intrusions there. And that's where the porphyry copper is. So if we look in a bit more detail, well, first of all, it is a commercial deposit. It's one of the biggest in the world. You can see the pit that's been dug there. And that means they've got a lot of data on, on the rocks that are now removed. So if you look at the central picture at the top, you can see the dashed line is the, the, the present day position of the of the um of the pit now i don't need to go through all, all the lithologies there but there are various igneous rocks <laughs> including diorite the dalam diorite is the one that i'm simply going to be talking about one rock actually from there so if you look at the lower diagram you'll see like I, i'm led to understand a lot of copper porphyry deposits you've got um an inner zone which is um called potassic alteration. It's got lots of potassium feldspar in it. And you've got an outer zone where you've got a lot of white mica. And these zones are formed by overprinting by metasomatism of the igneous rocks that you can see in the upper diagram there. So what's the motivation? Well, near the end, I'll show you some EBSD, which is why I got involved in this study. But actually, it's just intrinsically very interesting. It's a very different sort of metamorphism, but it is metasomatism. We should be able to apply the same toolbox of ideas as we do to other metasomatic processes, um, but it's not all that straightforward, really. And, and of course, I mean, copper is a, a, a metal that we need, and so perhaps in some fashion we can contribute by better understanding to knowing where else to find copper. Okay, so the kind of conceptual model is here. And the idea is you've got existing igneous rocks. You've got gas, magmatic vapor coming off from uh, some deeper igneous system there. And basically, that might be mixing with groundwater. Uh, the gas coming from the igneous system below is carrying copper, but also sulfur dioxide and other things. And not surprisingly, that's very reactive and reacts with the the existing rocks that it's percolating through there. So here is the rock that I'm going to discuss. So it's a chem scan map. And you can see there, you can see large blue objects that look like phenocrysts, and they once were phenocrysts of labradorite. So that's the pale blue. You can see we've got darker blue albite. You can see, if you look, that we've got sort of rather speckled pale green areas. And these were, these are biotite, but they're absolutely riddled with, with dark green potassium feldspar, this sort of dark, slightly bluish green. You can see this potassium feldspar all over the place, which is why this is called the potassic alteration zone there. And also you can see the, the, the copper minerals like bornite and chalcopyrite. And finally, last but not least, you can see veins here of anhydrite. Now, I think a fairly standard picture is, oh, the rock's got lots of potassium in it. So maybe there's been potassium introduced by metasomatism. But in fact, that turns out to be not, not necessarily a, a cornerstone of the explanation there. So, so we've got labradorite turning during that metasomatism into albite. And so you'll immediately realize that we're releasing calcium. And the only other calcium mineral in that rock, or the main one, is, is anhydrite. So we are turning a rather non-standard metamorphic reaction. This is not Barovian metamorphism. Uh, we're turning uh, anathite into uh, anhydrite, and then we're left over with albite there. And so that, that's one of the things that seems to be going on here. So if we go in in more detail, as I've explained, there's on the left is a large blue, what was a plagioclase, and there you can see a vein with anhydrite and bornite, copper mineral bornite. And if you look on the right-hand side, you'll see that actually 
just over right next to the vein, you've got alibi. So it seems pretty likely or it seems plausible that the calcium is just being removed from the plagioclase and we've got albi left over there. So it's begging a, a question of a reaction, something like what I've written there, but that's obviously not balanced. And I'll tell you now, don't expect much more than some balanced reactions because the thermodynamics of this is really not ready to be modeled in a, in a full fashion there. But I'll also in this talk say something about the reaction kinetics. Okay, so if we look at another detail in that field of view, we see there's the um, uh, olive green phlogopite absolutely shot through with potassium feldspar. So it seems eminently reasonable that uh, wherever else the potassium's come from, it looks like some of it has come from the breakdown of phlogopite there. Okay, so already you'll see there are some loose ends here because when you break, going back to the previous slide, actually, I will just go back there. If you're breaking labradorite down to make anhydrite, you've got aluminium left over. So what's the aluminium doing? So actually, we, we'll, um, we'll, we'll see that in a minute. But before I go on to what the aluminium's doing, what I'm showing you here is this is a data set based on thousands of analyses. I mean, look, it's a commercial mine. They've got a lot of data. And so... The, 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 we've got the potassium average, the phyllic average. Now, if you look over at these elements, there is some variation in potassium, but there isn't much. So basically, um, the, the general persuasion here is that, that, that there isn't much evidence of big potassium metasomatism. And indeed, you can do it. I'll show you that you can do the main changes without having to invoke potassium metasomatism. So in itself, that's a result that, that I think was quite interesting. So what that led me to think is, well, all right, so we're not moving the majors. We're obviously moving sulfur around and copper. So let's try and balance some reactions where we keep the major elements where they are, but we're going to shift some other elements around and see what we can do. So that's where the aluminium comes in. As I've already said, we want to make sure that we can account for the aluminium release from labradorite. And maybe this is part of the story, because when you look at the biotite in more detail, then I've just reminded myself about what we start with. We start with phlogopite over here, over here. And then the, the more altered rocks have got more and more aluminous biotite. So it looks maybe that the aluminium is going into easternite and siderophyllite there. So we've got a general trend towards more aluminous mica. Uh, but, of course, we're also breaking some of the mica down. So that's a kind of framework. So what I like to do next is explain what, just give you two balanced reactions. Uh, the first of all, sulfur is really weird stuff. Well, it's weird for me anyway. So we introduce SO2, and it, what it does is it ends up being, some of it is S2 minus sulfide and some of it is sulfate. So it kind of dissociates into two oxidation states there. But it's not doing this under its own control, although indeed there will be a delta G for the reaction that you're seeing there. It's doing it because it's being driven by the, the, the interactions that are happening with the solids. But I'm just showing you setting the scene by saying sulfur is doing its own redox. OK, so let's look at um, a balanced reaction. So this works. I mean, I'm not, so opinions vary. Should I use the real mineral compositions? No, I get a really big page full of complicated mineral formulae. So what I like to do is really just get a skeleton framework to understand. So take really simple stoichiometric mineral formulae and see what happens. And that's what happens there. So anothite plus anite, okay? We, we introduce uh, a gas with sulfur dioxide. We end up with a more aluminous biotite. We end up with anhydrite. We end up with bornite. These are what we see in the veins. And we predict that in the output gas, we're going to get some sulfuric acid, all right? So that, that's the kind of model reaction that helps us explain the solids that we see in the reaction products there. But there's another one. So this one actually is, as I've already said, you can break that out, like you can form K-Felsfar, and we know that we've just got um, iron oxide left over. And then if we combine that with some copper from the gas, the, the volcanic gas, then we, we make some bornite there. So that looks very plausible as a way of explaining how we, we, we're seeing the biotite riddled with potassium feldspar. The iron's moving a little way and probably combining to form bornite. So of course, 
what we'd want next is, well, what are the conditions of those reactions? Now, I'm not saying that they act independently of each other, because, of course, all of that will be controlled by a combination of thermodynamics and kinetics. But all I'm saying is it's a kind of it's a platform for me to try to understand these reactions more. You've got two independent reactions. They're both producing copper minerals. So what's the problem with the thermodynamics? Well, the trouble is that, that, that we've got common rock forming minerals in the initial dye, right? But well, I, and we'd lovely to be told I'm wrong, but I, I think that the, the gas we're dealing with has got sulfur dioxide, it's got hydrogen chloride, it's got copper chloride. I probably not standard in what we re would regard as widely used metamorphic packages. On the other hand, we have a package called HSC, where that's really good at modeling very complex gases, and even just within the gas, the partitioning of different molecular species. It's very good at all that, but it can't do solid solutions. So because one of the key reactions is plagioclase breaking down, we, we are going to get much insight from either of those packages right now. I mean, I will be happy to be told I'm wrong. But the next slide, I'll show you what happens when you do apply HSC. And it just gives a, a, a kind of glimmer of opportunity there. Because if you do mix a, a, a representative volcanic gas with plagioclase, sorry, with anathite, end member anathite, you do get some insights into what might happen. So this is at 40 megapascals. So can you see over, we've got temperature, we've got anathite, and then anathite, very quickly, as you cool below 760, this is incremental equilibrium, which, of course, is far from the case in this rock, but you, you do indeed find that anathite below about 780 is predicted to react with gas to form anhydrite. You see this grey line here is anhydrite. So the anathite drops down, the anhydrite goes up. You'll see that even that reaction is not univariant because it is sliding a little bit because the gas is full of all sorts of species that are ad adapt the, yeah, they're evolving quite quickly over that temperature range but you can use your imagination and say well hang on the other thing going to be the plagioclase plate will break down by a sliding action uh, we're not ready to um, model that yet but at least we're getting some initial insight it looks to me like that's giving us an upper limit for where the anhydrite producing reaction is and the lower limit is uh, we, we, we're not in the philic alteration zone, so we're going to be above this temperature where muscovite is stable. So that's really where we are in terms of understanding reaction. It's kind of baby steps, really. Um, but I also want to show you a, just a slide or two of kinetics. This is EBSD. This is how I got involved with this project. So this is plagioclase. Well, this is three times a feldspar in one slide. You'll see that we've got a big lump of the brand right there. That's the original igneous thing. We've got albite next to a vein, so making us suspicious the calcium is just draining out into the vein, conceptually draining, not actually draining. We've also got plates, a potassium feldspar there, which is doing all sorts of things. Here's the, oh, here's the EBSD. Don't worry about the details. All that matters here is these are crystallographic directions. <laughs> They're the same in the labradorite, the albite, and the K feldspar. They are all, the lattices are parallel to each other. This is strongly suggestive of the sorts of dissolution precipitation discussed by Putnis and others. And so it's very interesting. It looks like the lattice orientations have been inherited during these transformations. But uh, it's really important to realize we are dealing with a, a gas which is made of molecules. I had my wrist slapped by my co authors when I referred to ions in this fluid. Apparently, it's molecules. I, and yeah, so it's a steep learning curve for me. I won't lie to you. Yeah, yeah, I did. It's molecules of sodium chloride. It's not ions. Crazy, huh? <laughs> okay, so uh, really, this is really very much work in progress, but it's absolutely fascinating. And so, for me to try and say, let's go right back. Come on, let's just get some balanced reactions sorted out. I think there are things we can do with the HSC package, which I'm going to discuss with the co-authors. And certainly, number three, we're actively pursuing that because actually, yeah, at the end of the day, the kinetics of these reactions may be as important for copper deposit production as the equilibrium thermodynamics. So that's where we're at. Thank you for your attention.